Hello, everybody. Uh, is this on? Yes, you can hear me in the back? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess my credentials for proving I'm a futurist, I guess, is that 1973 was my first email. Oh, yeah. uh, we called it Computer Mediated Communications and Messaging then. Um, and um, in the late, no, early 1980s, I hooked up or helped hook up 29 developing countries into what's called X.25. For those that don't know what X.25 is, it's the reason the Internet's cheap. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be too privately expensive. Anyway, um, I passed around this little uh, flyer here. I, I didn't anticipate there's going to be that many people. So if anybody wants information from me that I don't cover, the future's large enough not that I won't be able to cover it all in one 15-minute period. I thought I'd pick out a couple of ideas um, that I thought would be interesting to look in the future. These are not too far in the future. Uh, some of these are implemented today. Uh, the first is a telenation. A telenation is the concept of uh, a different approach to beating the brain drain. We have had a lot of UN conferences about how to beat the brain drain, and we have not been successful. All right? So give it up. Accept that the guy is going to be in New York, or the girl is going to be in Paris, or the brother is going to be in uh, somewhere else, and say, how do you hook them up? You know, it's like computer dating. If you make a list in your country, what are all those development requirements you've got? What of those requirements can be helped by uh, communications so that the brain doesn't have to be in the same room at the same time? The brain can be somewhere else. Um, uh, the most recent ones coming up, I think a couple of days ago, opened up in uh, Montenegro. Uh, so if you do Tele Montenegro, you'll, you'll find their nascent beginning of sight. So imagine you have uh, all these brain, you have clubs. A lot of developing countries have national clubs around the world, in Europe, the United States, and so forth. So I would ask the ambassadors to the UN, ambassadors of those countries, to hold little meetings and say, hey, how many of you want to help out your country? You know, here's this laundry list. If you want to do this, you click here. If you want to do this, click there. But then back home, you've got to list those things. So for example, a, a website might start off with a movie star or the number one personality of the country saying, welcome to Tele Ecuador or Costa Rica or whatever it is. Uh, would you like to represent products in New York or wherever they happen to be accessing from? Would you like to review business plans? Maybe the person works at the World Bank or IMF. The average small, medium guy doesn't get a hot shot analysis of a business plan, but by telecommunications, you can do that. You don't have to be in the same room for that. Uh, maybe you would like to assist your own hometown. What can you do in your hometown while you're sitting there in New York or Paris? A lot. You can grade homework or papers, all kinds of different things. Anyway, so that's the idea. Countries create a database of development um, tele-opportunities, uh, and the national clubs then match them up, and uh, the nation-state website matches needs and resources, uh, sort of like computer dating, in the same way. Very simple idea, not a heavily expensive one. Uh, I see this as something that should be done in every single developing country uh, in the world. Uh, another one is self-employment by the Internet. This is the unfinished revolution, in my judgment. Uh, the old revolution, of course, was the sun, we believe, was uh, uh, revolving around the Earth, remember? And the revolution was you change the orbit for the center point. All right? So that's what Internet's done. In the old days, the market was the middle and everybody revolved around it. What the information revolution means is that change of orbit and center point. Those two billion people you saw on the on a chart there, are surrounded by two billion people. It's not a zero-sum game. Every one of the two billion is surrounded by two billion. Now, you can look for markets. If it's true that there's not enough jobs, then what are we going to do? You create your own job. Well, how can you create your own job? You couldn't in the past. There wasn't enough business in this local, local situation to keep you going. But with two billion people around the world, there certainly is. Let's say you like to teach juggling. How many people in the world want to go on a Skype and so forth and watch you learn how to juggle? You know, and you charge maybe $10 for it. So like click here, PayPal, or whatever you're using, and you have people that you're teaching juggling all around the world. Let's say you're a Maasai warrior, and you want to teach people how you handle, handle lions. Hopefully we don't kill any in the process. But we can just show them how to do it. How many people in the world would like to know how a Maasai warrior becomes a warrior? You know, a bunch of folks in Kenya can do that. How many people would pay 10 bucks for that out of 2 billion? Probably more than 5. So, information revolution 
individuals and groups are surrounded by two billion people. You should be able to figure out what are those two billion people that you can offer uh, would pay for. And you got the electronic uh, transfer of funds and all that uh, capable. So seek m markets instead of non-existent jobs. Uh, what can you do? Uh, maybe people want to hear Mali music. Maybe people want to hear some other sort of cultural thing. Doesn't cost you much to do it, you know? And then you can have that uh, access by different people. Uh, how many capabilities are there? It's extraordinary. This is a totally untapped thing. Now, I'll give you an example of an African traditional witch doctor, because I used to be a Peace Corps volunteer hanging out with them doing medicine, leprosy, and tuberculosis. So I speak with some sort of familiarity of what's possible here. A village uh, witch doctor, traditional healer, can go with his nephew, who speaks English, to the cyber cafe in the capital for $2 or $3 for the bus ride. They can go to the cyber cafe and they can say, okay, here's a couple of dollars for whatever is the time there. And by the way, we would like to make a deal with you uh, that, it, that, that people would uh, charge uh, their credit card to you. We'll just trust that you'll give us some money. Well, we'll split it half and half. Whatever we make, we'll take half, you take half, we'll come back every week. So you take out a photograph of this traditional uh, witch doctor. You know, witchcraft consultancy, click here. You know, ten dollars. You know, put in your little you know text message and so forth. How many people in the world would be interested in getting a real live African witch doctor giving some advice? Probably more than five, but let's say ten. So there's ten dollars per ten people in in one week. Maybe that's a hundred dollars. For those who are familiar with rural Malawi, ten you know hundred dollars is a lot more than you make in a year. You can make that in a week. Now, what was your investment? It's like roughly $10, you know, the round trip, the whole business, put it all together. So I figure if, an, if a non-English speaking witch doctor can make a f living on the internet, what can the rest of the world do of those two billion? So as we move to that three billion that uh, Nolan was talking about, let's keep in mind that we can think in terms of self-employment, finding markets around the world. That's not gonna solve all the world's economic problems. But it certainly helps the problem when somebody says there's not enough jobs. Because there's certainly enough interest in the world, in the rest of the world. So you just match it up again, like the dating. Now, the agricultural age, the focus was land. The industrial age, the focus was machine. And the knowledge age, the focus is the brain. We used to believe that the brain could not be improved. So all we could do in education was pour knowledge into it and make you socially acceptable. Well, we now know that the brain can be improved. Neuroproesis, do a Google search, neuroproesis, do a Google search on increasing intelligence, and I guarantee you, you'll have a whole new view about the brain. We can do a lot with our brain that we're not doing yet. I want to quickly click through this because it's a little bit off message, but I couldn't resist it. One, responding to feedback. It's not getting feedback. That makes you stupid. Information overload. Responding to it, you got to deselect stuff. You got to say no. You got to say yes. You got to have something. You got to finish the loop. That's what wires the brain. It's not getting it. Two, consistency of love, diversity of environment. The brain's not going to learn if it's threatened. It shrinks. And if there's nothing new, why should the brain learn? So when the baby's crib, you know, they put all these little hanging things down there to make them, you know, stimulate the brain. That's great, but change the color or the space location every day because if it's the same hanging down every day. The kid's bored. The brain doesn't grow. Nutrition, well, that's an obvious one. Reasoning exercises, we know about playing the piano and playing chess. We know about these things. Now this is the cheapest one to do and one of the least ones done. The placebo effect. Everybody in medicine knows if you think you're going to get sicker, you get sicker. 10% or so, they guess. They don't know. So let's say 10%. And, and the reverse 10%. Well, that's a 20% spread. Do that with brain functioning and you're going from normal to ge almost subgenius. Or you're going from moron to normal. That's a big deal. Now, we all know that in many parts of the world, they don't get enough iron and protein as a child between three to five because they come off the breast, which means the brain doesn't develop properly. All right? There's ways to stimulate the brain after that. So people will say, well, if you got quasi cord, that's the way it is. You know, nothing you can do. Yes, there is. Uh, contact intelligent people, and you know, we, all, we all know that nature mimics. We all do that. You know, tuning fork you hit, take another tuning fork, it picks up the vibration. We know this. But 99% of the people cannot hang out with 1%, except you can in cyberspace. Those 2 billion people can hang out with Albert Einstein, or whatever genius there is. There is genius culture, by the way. And how do you experience genius culture? How does that stimulate the brain? Software and reasoning games, we know this. Now, of course, South Korea overdoes it, you know, 
Sugar's good for you, but you have too much, you're not good. Um, anyway, so I got, I got three minutes to tell you about the rest of the stuff. So collective intelligence is the next step, next big thing. Uh, and that's the interaction of experts and, and hardware and uh, information where they can each change each other. So uh, collective intelligence is an emergent process, an emergent process. It's not a, a relational database, it's not adding up experts. Uh, we've done this in Kuwait for the uh, government there. There are the three balls, and then you ho hook together expert software and so forth. They can change each other all the time. We've done this in Korea for climate change. Uh, one of the institutional changes we think is trans institutions. Talked about the actors and so forth. Put them together in a new institutional structure. We've got for profit law, we've got non profit law. I want a third category called trans institutional law. Trans institution is where the bo governing body is of uh, UN or international systems, NGOs, governments, individuals, uh, corporations, and some people that just ought to be there. So you can have a trans institution with AIDS, you can have a, a trans institution with increasing intelligence, you can have a trans institution for IT. Um, the people who do it should come from those uh, categories. Uh, the income should come from all those categories. And the products should serve all those categories. Now, one of the advantages of this means that you can act through any category. Sometimes it's more efficient to act through one category than another. But if you're in one category, you don't have that choice. You have to like work out a public-private partnership, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about new institutional structure. People talk about institutional innovation. This is an institutional innovation. Now, uh, which means you've got to have your bottom line together because business is there. You've got to have your politics together because government is there. You've got to have your values together because NGOs are there. You've got to have your knowledge together because universities are there. And I speak from experience because my own think tank, a global one called the Millennium Project, which is not Jeffrey Sachs' UN Millennium Project. It's a separate outfit altogether. We were formed before all this sort of stuff. But we were formed by UN organizations. We're independent, 100% uh, NGO independent around the world. But we were formed by UN organizations, governments, NGOs, corporations, and universities, and we're acting like a trans institution. So when we need to be UN, we are. When we need to be government, we are. It's a flexibility and a cost effect that when the UN University evaluated us, they couldn't believe the output per dollar input. We have 41 of these little things around the world. This is a global brain picking system, so this is how we do global local on a, on a global basis. Now, uh, on our management, is it going into the information age? What's the implications? How has the information age changed management structures? Right now, it hasn't. It's augmented them, it's made them more efficient, but it hasn't changed them that much. The old hierarchy we all know about, we have networks to defeat hierarchical control going across the systems. Then what you do is you intersect two or more networks. That's a no. That's my definition of a no, cybernetics. Two more networks, you inter interact. Which means that the richness of interaction is much better because we're all of a similar mind here. All right? So imagine you take some of these other conferences working on different things and you intersect them. You get a richness. That's how the brain likes to grow intelligence. So then after nodes, you hook up nodes into fields of play. That's step four. Step five is then you hook up fields of play. That's how the Millennium Project is managed and Harvard Business School goes with it. Let's go back to step number two. I said, within the information age, the thing that's important here that I'd like to leave with you, my comment about this almost 40 years ago, <laughs> email, people talk oh, constantly underrated, constantly underrated the potentials of change in every single area that I've worked in. Constantly, that's the thing. Now, People say, well, with Moore's Law, the change will continue. I go, yeah, but what's going to happen with your chairman's Moore's Law is the volume of change in the last 25 years is going to look small compared to the volume of change in the next 25 years. So you've got to think way more outrageously than we have. Now, quick little final deal here. This is a think trick. You can do this one yourself. Take, take out what you think are the most important elements of what you're working on in IT or whatever it happens to be, and they cross-impact them. You list them down one side and you repeat the same ones across the top. This is how inventors invent. You know, you put two or more things together that weren't there before and you create value. So how do you train yourself to do that? Here's one way. So here you can see the first one is telenations, collective intelligence, internet self-employment, trans institutions, and government, uh, internet is a goal for everybody. All right. So that you fill this in, like cell number one is filled in by saying, how will telenations change or influence how collective intelligence develops? How will telenations affect self-employment on the internet? How will telenations affect trans institutions? And then you can have it the reverse way. I guarantee you, if you list down five things that's important to you on your changes, and you cross impact them, I guarantee you, a dinner anywhere in New York, <laughs> that you'll come up with an idea you've never had before. Uh, we put all these things in the state of the future, that's why I handed out that sort of stuff. I will not be here tomorrow. If anybody's interested in follow up, I'll probably leave somewhere in the mid afternoon. Uh, thank you very much.